Hello, uh, welcome to the Abstract Station 6 in TCT AP 2021. My name is uh, Donnie Firman, and then I will moderate this, this session with my senior, my teacher, Professor Tegu Santoso. And uh, also we have uh, distinguished panelists here, Dr. Eng Leung Goh, Dr. Cho Yun Lee, and Dr. Kengo Tanabe. So we will have five uh, speakers who will present uh, their uh, studies. And then each speaker will have a four, uh, six minutes presentation and four minutes discussion. So due to the limited of time, I will ask uh, Professor Santoso to introduce our first speaker. Yes, thank you so much, Dr. Doni. It is my great pleasure to introduce the first speaker, Dr. Huang, from Seoul National University uh, Hospital, Korea. He's going to present his uh, study in, entitled Angiographic Complete Revascularization versus Incomplete Revascularization in Patients with Diabetes Mellitus. Dr. Huang, time is yours. Thank you, Chairman. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Dr. Huang from Seoul National University Hospital. It is my great honor to present this topic on this prestigious occasion. I have nothing to disclose. Diabetes has been considered as a risk equivalent to coronary artery disease. And the risk was reported to be different according to the anatomical disease burden. Coronary artery disease in diabetes is more likely to be diffuse disease, multi-basic disease, and more significant plaque burden with lipid-rich plaque. And previous studies reported a greater plaque progression in diabetic patients. In addition to this, uh, diabetes is one of the stronger, strong predictors of stent thrombosis. All of this lead to worse cardiovascular outcome and make coronary revascularization more challenging in diabetic patients. Angiographic complete revascularization is an effort to minimize the ischemic burden by removing all visible significant coronary artery disease. The previous sub-study of syntax trial reported that the residual syntax score was a powerful indicator of five-year mortality. And they also reported that the residual syntax score of eight can be a reasonable level of revascularization. However, considering the nature of the DM and the complex PCI can lead to, uh, complex revascularization can lead to more complex PCI, it is controversial whether the complete revascularization is beneficial in diabetic patients. In this regard, we performed this study to investigate the clinical implications of complete vascularization in diabetic patients. We defined complete vascularization as residual syntax score of zero. The current study is a circle analysis of grand DS registry in Korea. We analyzed 2,000 patients with DM and 3,500 patients without DM or patients underwent second generation DS. The primary endpoint was patient-oriented composite outcome at three years. This is the composite of all cause deaths, NEMI, and any clinically driven revascularization. The secondary endpoint was target based failure at three years. Baseline characteristics shows that the, the patients after incomplete revascularization was older and have more underlying comorbidities than complete revascularization patients. And clinical presentation also different, especially for the non-DM population. Recent characteristics shows that the patients with incomplete revascularization have, been, have a more complex and extensive coronary artery disease. And these results might infer that there is a possibility of difficulties in achieving complete revascularization in incomplete revascularization in our study. As the previous studies reported, the risk of POCO and TRF at three years were higher in the DM patients than in non-DM patients. After uh, adjusting the co-variables, the, the risk was 143 higher in the DM patients in both outcomes. 
when we divide the patients into two groups, DM population and non-DM population, we could find that the cumulative instances of POCO at three years were higher in incomplete revascularization group than in complete revascularization group. Uh, considering the uneven distribution of uh, underlying comorbidities, we adjusted the hazard ratio and we found that uh, the risk of POCO at three years was significantly lower in complete revascularization even after this, uh, this adjustment. However, this risk was uh, more prominent, prominent in the DM population than non-DM population. Interestingly, the stent-oriented composite outcome was similar between the complete and incomplete revascularization, regardless of the presence of DM. We also did a various software analysis for the sensitivity analysis and and we could find that all results show, or all, all subgroups show the same trends of uh, same trends with the main outcome. We also evaluated the reasonable level of revascularization, and the razor syntax score of seven point five uh, was the reasonable level of revascularization in our study group. When using this cutoff value, we divided the patient into three groups, and we could. Find, we could find that the patients with radio syntax score below 7.5 show the comparable risk of POCO compared with the complete revascularization group. We also calculated the percent change of uh, syntax score. This is the uh, percent change of pre baseline and post PCI syntax score. And we could find that the risk of POCO at three years decreased uh, along with the increased percent change of syntax score, and it was uh, uh, it was increased until around fifty percent of the syntax score. However, it was twenty five percent in non DM patients. In summary, the clinical benefit of angiographic complete vascularization is more prominent in patients with DM than without DM after three years of follow up. Relieving razor disease might be more critical in DM population than in the non-DM population. There might be reasonable level of revascularization in the DM population and comprehensive approach combining various modalities might be beneficial based on the understanding of the nature of DM in coronary artery disease. Ladies and gentlemen, this is my conclusion. The clinical benefit of comp angiographic complete revascularization is more prominent in patients with DM than, with, than without DM after three years of follow-up. Relieving radio disease might be more critical in DM population than in the non-DM population. Thank you for your attention. Very nice study, Dr. Huang. Congratulations. And uh, the data is also uh, very robust. Uh, I have one question to you. In what situation would you like your uh, complex uh, the diabetic patients to uh, undergo surgery? Because we know with uh, a coronary artery bypass surgery, uh, you may get a better revascularization. Uh, thank you for your comment. Yes, I, I truly agree with your opinion about uh, sending the patient to the uh, surgeons in, in case of the very complex in case of expecting very complex PCI. But and uh, the in our study, the baseline syntax score was around 20. And I think that the, the DM pa patients with uh, less severe population were included in our study. But uh, we cannot send all the patient or DM patient to the surgeons. And I think that if we can to the revascularization better, uh, I think it is more uh, good for the patient to revascularization by PCI. Dr. Donnie, would you like to have a question? Uh, uh, is, uh, any questions? Uh, yes, uh, Dr. Wang. Uh, I just ask a simple question whether uh, you divide but between a ACS patients and then stable, stable patient. <clears throat> is there any data regarding that? Yeah, uh, in our study, we excluded the AMI patients. So, uh, our study population only included unstable angina and stable ischemic <laughs> heart disease patients because uh, we we saw there was 
uh, different trend of results in the AMI patients. And we think that the, in, the, in patient, patients with AMI, we have to consider more other things for the patient's outcome, such as the door to volume time or uh, uh, how, how much revascularization will be done in the index procedure and so on. Thank you. Any other questions from other Can I ask a question? Yes, Dr. Yeah. Abe, please. Thank you very much for the nice presentation, Dr. Huang. Uh, my question is, could you please let us know the reason for incomplete revascularization? For example, sometimes we cannot perform complete revascularization if patients are too frail due to the high age or patients may have had malignant disease or just regions are too tough uh, to be revascularized technically. So could you please let, let us know the reason for that? Yeah, thank you for your comments. And most of the patients, uh, there, there are about 60% of incomplete vascularization in our study group, a study population. And the major reason was the uh, 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 hard to revascularize, revascularizing the lesion. And because more complex PCI was done in incomplete revascularization group, and as as I shown you, uh, show you that mm -hmm. the lesion complexity was more uh, significantly uh, complex in the uh, incomplete revascularization group. Thank you very much. Yes, I, I have a question here, Dr. Huang. Uh, do you look into the complications that uh, you know, caused by this uh, revascularization, especially when you perform the complete uh, revascularization in these uh, complex situations? Do you compare the, whether the complication, complication rate is higher in, when you perform the complete mm -hmm. revascularization? Uh, thank you for your comment. Uh, actually, our study was from the observational registry, so well, we could not get that uh, complicating complication rates in all the patients, so uh, we could not compare that uh, the results. All right. So uh, since we already uh, passed the time, so uh, thank you very much, Dr. Huang, for the very nice study. So it is my turn to introduce our second speaker, uh, Dr. Muhammad Ashik Alfat bin uh, Muhammad Rafali from PPUKA Malaysia. So he will present his study regarding the history of severe hyperglycemia in type 2 diabetes mellitus unmasked significant atherosclerosis coronary artery disease, a match case control study. Uh, please, Dr. Rafali. All right. So uh, my abstract entitled is this, the hyperglycemia in type 2 diabetics is associated with significant CAD. Uh, so it's a match case control study. I have nothing to uh, disclose. Okay, so I'm interested. So severe hypoglycemia is a major adverse complication of intensive glycemic control associated with adverse cardiovascular events. And it is defined by symptomatic hypoglycemia requiring third party intervention. And the incidence of severe hypoglycemia in type 2 diabetics is about 0.8 per person per year and a prevalence of 6% among diabetics. And the adjusted hazards ratio for cardiovascular events from numerous studies showed about to be two to four. So this is a match case control study done in our center from December 2019 till July 2020. Our primary objective was to compare the severity of CAD between type 2 diabetics with history of severe hypoglycemia and uh, type 2 diabetics with no history of severe hypoglycemia and to determine the prevalence of CAD in these patients by a coronary artery calcium score and coronary CT angiography. Our secondary objective was to de determine the temporal and dose response relationship of cardiac inflammatory biomarkers and severity of CAD with history of severe hypoglycemia in type 2 diabetics by biomarkers such as high 70 CRP and matrix metalloprotease 9. The novelty in the study, uh, there was no previous study done to objectively investigate the severity of CAD in this patient, and we don't know the prevalence of CAD in this group of patients. So as this is a pilot study, our sample size was calculated with Kelsey formula and the minimum sample amount was about 26 patients. We used uh, the Toshiba Ecolon 1 uh, CT scan, the protocol, uh, single fast gated 640 slice helical CT and our images were in, was interpreted by the experienced radiologist using standard approach of analysis. Our definition of significant CAD was coronary artery calcium score of 400 or more and or presence of at least one major coronary artery with 50% or more stenosis from CT angiography. And most patients with coronary artery calcium score of 800 or more do not proceed with uh, coronary CT angiography due to the poor lumen visualization. 
our inclusion criteria was tied to diabetics with history of severe hypoglycemia within the last five years. All documented episodes, not from memory recall to reduce bias. And our exclusion criteria was uh, type 1 diabetics, age less than 40 years, EGF of less than 30, established CAD before index CT scan, and also other tendencies of developing severe hypo. So this is our uh, results for the baseline characteristic of each group. You can see most of the parameters are matched in terms of the gender, the age, and also the comorbidities to make sure there's no bias towards uh, CAD. And this is the results for clinical biomarkers in between each group. As you can see that high sensitivity CRP is much more elevated in the severe hypo group, 0.41 as compared to 0.16, with a p of 0.029. <coughs> and from our coronary uh, calcium score, it shows that patients with severe hypo has indeed higher median calcium score, 277, compared to 56, with a p-value of 0.03. And more patients in group of calcium score of 100 or more of, uh, with severe hypoglycemia, 75%, compared with 43% in the non-severe hypoglycemia group. For the CT coronary angiography, as you can see, uh, more patients have uh, more significant stenosis for severe hypoglycemia group, about 72%, as compared with 39% in the non-severe hypoglycemia group, or with uh, p-value of 0.036, and with a predominance of right coronary artery uh, for the severe hypoglycemia group. And if we do a subgroup analysis based from our definition, uh, the prevalence of CAD in the severe hypoglycemia group is about 95% uh, in age less than 60 years as compared with uh, 60%. So we did a subgroup analysis for patients with recurrent history of severe hypoglycemia. Uh, as you can see, the CT calcium score median is uh, significantly elevated, 668 as compared with 202 in the non-severe hypoglycemia group with a p-value of 0.04. And another subgroup analysis, if we com uh, compare those who uh, we investigate within the first month of severe hypoglycemia, they have more elevated high 70 CRP value, about 2.05 as compared with 0.38 with a p-value of 0.045. So the discussion points, does severe hypoglycemia has causality or correlation with cardiovascular disease? As it is, it is unethical if we perform a randomized uh, clinical trial to induce severe hypo in patients, uh, so what, we, what can we do is actually to associate uh, severe hypoglycemia uh, properties, that is the dose response, and also temporality towards cardiovascular disease. As this study showed that patients with recurrent severe hypo had higher coronary arterial calcium score, and patients who we investigate within the first one of severe hypo had higher high CMT CRP value, uh, noting that they have more inflammatory uh, process at the time. Second discussion point is, uh, should we screen all type 2 diabetic patients who develop severe hypo for CAD? As there's no randomized clinical trial to determine the benefit of screening such patient, we recommend a just individual approach for each patient. Uh, as severe hypo patient already has uh, high risk to develop significant cardiovascular disease. And the next discussion point, should we adopt a less stringent approach for type glycemic control in type 2 diabetics patient who develop severe hypo? As there are many studies showing that patient with uh, intensive glycemic uh, control uh, had more mortality as compared with less stringent approach, we recommend that this patient uh, manage less stringently uh, for their HbA1c target. So the conclusion for the study is type 2 diabetics with silver hypo had higher high SMD CRP values, more severe degree of coronary artery disease as compared to those without severe hypo with an odds ratio of 4.23. And type 2 diabetics with history of recurrent silver hypo had higher coronary artery calcium score as compared with single cell silver hypoglycemia. And type 2 diabetics with recent silver hypoglycemia within the first month had higher high SMD CRP value as compared with those beyond the first month. And the prevalence of significant CED in type 2 diabetics with history of severe hypoglycemia is about 79%. And if age uh, more than 60, the prevalence is about 95%. Okay, that's all from my presentation. Thank you very much, Dr. Rapali, for the uh, nice study and nice presentation. It's very, very interesting. So uh, I think it's very novelty. So uh, my first question will be, uh, can you repeat again the background or the biological possibility between hypoglycemia and the severity of CAD. Can, can you repeat in one or two words, please? Okay, so actually there's numerous studies studying the acute effects of severe hypoglycemia. Uh, that is, severe hypoglycemia tends to cause uh, arrhythmia in patients, you know, prolonged QT. And also they did, uh, they checked the biomarkers. If uh, when patients have uh, severe hypoglycemia, they note that uh, interleukin-6 is raised, the matrix nitroplatinase uh, 9 also raised. It shows that there's uh, inflammatory effects 
uh, towards the cardiovascular system when patients in, uh, encounter severe hypoglycemia. So in terms of chronic uh, processes, because we don't have randomized clinical trial studying the effects of repeated severe hypo, because it's unethical if we induce severe hypo in patients. So that's why what can we uh, extrapolate is by associating with its properties, such as the dose effect, the more severe hypo you get, the worst coronary artery calcium score you, uh, you have in this patient. And also patients who had severe hypo episode within the first year show to have higher mortality rate as compared to those beyond of the first year as a study in Korea previously. Thank you very much. Uh, is there any, any more question from the uh, co-moderator, Prof. Santoso? Oh, oh, Dr. Lee, please. Thank you for your nice presentation. I have um, one question. In my opinion, patients mm. with a uh, history of uh, severe hypoglycemia may be considered to very different group from a uh, patient without a uh, history of uh, severe hypoglycemia. Uh, hypoglycemia. Have yes. you not investigated whether uh, DM complications such as retinopathy, microalbuminuria, and uh, peripheral artery disease or uh, neurofasci occurred? Do okay. you have any plan to further adjust DM severity between these two groups? Mm -hmm. Okay, actually, because this study, we only, uh, we actually match uh, both groups based on EGFR. So this study has no patients with EGFR less than 30 to make sure that uh, there's no confounding effects towards the uh, severity of CAD. But uh, we also like functional studies uh, in terms of the coronary, uh, coronary vascular, cardiovascular disease, just, uh, such as we don't have uh, the, uh, if there's is ischemia in this patient by doing a PET scan, for this patient. But uh, what can we say is uh, when we do a CT coronary angiography and calcium score, they tend to have worse uh, uh, coronaries and also calcium score as compared to those without CCO severe hypo. Uh, but uh, I think in, in the next future, we can plan to include patients with uh, that, you know, like peripheral vascular disease, uh, with microalbuminuria, actually to get uh, more of our understanding about uh, severe hypoglycemia process towards cardiovascular disease. I have one question to you. It's a very interesting study, but mm -hmm. uh, we all know that uh, from uh, various studies like uh, UKPDA, SVADT, and ACCORD, and so on, uh, mm -hmm. this, all these studies shows that uh, there is no good correlations between uh, diabetic control and macroangiopathy, because we know that diabetes is a multifactorial disease. There is a good correlation between diabetic control and microangioplasty, but not microangioplasty. So uh, uh, it is still, it's, to me, it is, uh, it is still puzzling to correlate between hypoglycemia, which is a very, with, of course, for a very short period of time, and uh, coronary artery disease uh, or the extent uh, severity of coronary artery disease in diabetes mellitus. Uh, yes. Thank you for the comment. For me, because this is a, a bit of cross-sectional study, we just take a snapshot of the patient and no uh, follow-up in terms of uh, assessing their coronary artery calcium score. So I think that will be in our plans uh, to investigate whether this patient who developed severe hypo had more tendency to have like accelerated atherosclerosis and see the correlation uh, towards uh, uh, severe uh, CVD in the future. Mm -hmm. So... Uh... Let's move to uh, other speaker. Uh, let me introduce uh, Dr. Panipa Suwanasom from Maharaj Nakom Chamai Hospital Thailand. So uh, Dr. Suwanasom will uh, present uh, her study regarding the prevalence of high bleeding risk patient according to the uh, ARC HBA criteria and the incidence of bleeding outcome in Southeast Asian patients who receive uh, percutaneous coronary intervention in single center retrospective study. Uh, Dr. Swanasam from Haraj Nakon Chamai Hospital Thailand. Please, Dr. Swanasam. Okay, so my topic today is about the RHBR criteria, about the prevalence and the incident of bleeding. So, um, as you know, uh, this is my uh, disclosure. As you know, that the, the RCHB criteria or the side up score have been recommended for buying the patient at high bleeding risk. And that's already have a validation study about the H, uh, HBR in various populations and show the excellent performance in predicting breeding outcome. However, the data in Southeast Asian, Southeast Asian patient population, um, there's no data of prevalence, the incident of bleeding, the performance of uh, HBR uh, against the pre-side mm -hmm. score 
to predict the bleeding and ischemic outcomes. So in this study, we sought to evaluate the performance of uh, ARCHBR and precise depth to predict the bleeding and ischemic event. So um, the study population complies of the patient 599 uh, that we uh, did the PCI between the May 2018 to July 2019. And uh, as you can see, these all uh, 12 criteria in the RHBR. The criteria in the red circle uh, has been prospectively collected in our database. But for the criteria that in the blue circle, uh, this thing we have to do the retrospective collected with the investigator who buy to the patient outcome. Afterward, we um, retrospectively adjudicated the patient whether they have uh, HBR or not by using the criteria if they met uh, one major or two minor HBR. Um, 80 patients were excluded from the analysis because of incomplete data. Finally, we have a 519 of the patients um, included in the analysis. 32.8% uh, uh, of the population was HBR group and 68.2% uh, of the patients were um, non-HBR. The primary outcome of the study was the bar type three or five at one year follow-up and the secondary outcome was the cardiac death at one year follow-up. And um, when we explore the proportion of the HBR patient by uh, each AR HBR criteria, the most common um, majority criteria uh, was hemoglobin less than 11, uh, whereas for the minor criteria, the most common criteria was uh, the age more than 75 years old. And this is the best life characteristic of the patient. The age of the patient who has HBR uh, was higher than the non-HBR, the hypertension, type 2 diabetes, um, were frequently observed in the HBR group. And, for, and this is quite interesting because we also explore the performance of preside depth score. The preside depth score, the mean score is 25, which is comparable uh, between the two groups. And uh, the proportion of the patient who classify as a preside depth, also 51.5 in HBR and 53% in non-HBR, which is non-statistically significant difference. Uh, the depth duration uh, for 12 months in the HBR also um, uh, the proportion of the patient is less than non-HBR group. And this is a primary outcome, as you can see from the left side bar graph. Uh, the primary outcome, which is a bar type 3 or 5, is borderline uh, significant. So there's, um, the p-value is just 0 0.05. But when we explore to the bleeding outcome, like bar 2, 3, 5, and uh, bar 3, there's a significant uh, that. Um, different between the HBR and non-HBR. But when we explore uh, by classify the patient into the uh, precise depth more than 25 and less than 25, um, there were no significant difference among uh, these endpoints. Later, we uh, explore the secondary outcome. As you can see from the Kaplan-Meier curve, um, the cardiac death in the HBR group is significantly higher than the non-HBR with a hazard ratio of 4.1. And uh, also we uh, compare between ARC HBR and the free side depth score, as you can see that the all-cause uh, all death and the cardiac death significantly different when we use the HBR and, non and um, HBR criteria. But when we use a precise depth score, there's um, no significant difference. And then later, we um, assess the of the ARC HBR criteria by assigning one uh, point to the major criteria and 0.5 to the one minor criteria. As you can see from this pie chart, the proportion of the patient um, uh, mostly have only 1.48%. And the uh, mean ARC HBR score that we assign the score to the patient in HBR group is 1.43. Uh, Non-HBR is just only 0.19. Um, 
And for the precise lab, there's no significant difference between uh, HBR and non-HBR because it's just 27. And later we want to explore the performance of um, ARC, HBR and precise depth. So we do the ROC and see that uh, how it can predict the event. But uh, if you can see that the curve is not nice because the number of event is quite low. So uh, I would say that for the ARC, HBR and precise depth maybe uh, not um, at this time because the number of event is quite low so it cannot predict uh, the event but for the cardiac the the performance of the hbi is quite okay with the auc with um, 0.67 so for the discussion point in this case um, i think that uh, because in this study the bleeding event is less than the definition of uh, HBR, which the, the bar three and five should be more than 4% per year, but in our population it's just only 1%. So uh, it can be like under reporting of the bleeding even, or actually the criteria could not capture the risk because of the population that's different. Um, second is the limitation of sample size and low event rate. Um, that's uh, because of nature of a retrospective study. And also um, in our real practice, um, we, which, which score shall we use? Because for the R, HBI and precise lab is the data that derived from the clinical trial, but not for real life. So uh, this is my conclusion that um, in this retrospective single study, 32.8 of Thai population, let's say of South, yeah, Southeast Asia patient uh, were high bidding risk. And the most common major criteria was hemoglobin less than 11, and minor criteria was age more than 75. Uh, patient at HBR, either with major or minor criteria, they carry not only the high bleeding risk, but also the ischemic risk. And uh, the performance of the ARC HBR um, can discriminate the bleeding event and uh, cardiac death better than the precise death. And as I have said before, due to the small size of the patient and single center, the results should be cautiously interpreted. Thank you. All right, uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Swan Asan. It's very interesting, uh, very you know, local Southeast Asian uh, patient. So, is there any comment or any any question from the uh, from the other panelists? Maybe. Uh, yes, Dr. Tanabe, yeah. please. Thank you very much for your nice presentation. I'm interested in the results. Uh, my question is, could you please let me know the status of antiplatelet therapy when patient had bleeding events? Because if most of the patients on dual antiplatelet therapy at the time of bleeding events, maybe the next step, uh, next uh, solution should be uh, shortening the duration of DAPT. So could you please uh, let me let us know? Yes, so uh, because actually uh, we do not have our local guideline of uh, what should be done for, for when the patient has bleeding, but this is a local practice. So normally if the patient came with the bleeding event, so uh, if it's um, less than three months, we uh, switch from Ticagular. I, I would say that uh, mostly of um, uh, the <laughs> that is uh, copidogel ticagular and prasugel. Um, if they, they uh, have been uh, taking uh, ticagular, then we, we will switch down to the copidogel. But if it's uh, after three months, we change to copidogel, oh, sorry, we change to aspirin only. Yeah. My question is, uh, please let me know the status of antiplatelet therapy at the time of bleeding events. Oh. A dual or single? Ah, it's dual because actually our bleeding even mostly occur in the actually mostly occur in the in 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 the in, in the hospital admission. So uh, that's why the patient mostly will uh, want the dual and dependent. Okay, thank you. All right, thank you. Is there any 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 more comment or any question for the other Doctor Gold? Maybe you can unmute. Yeah, okay. may I ask a question here? What do you think, uh, why Asian populations, uh, you, know, you can use this ARC-HBR uh, uh, score more accurate to predict the bleeding risk as compared to precise uh, DAPT? 
Mm. What's the reason? What is the reason? Um, I think maybe because the patient in our population, the, the age is older, and uh, also uh, the EGFR also different. Um, so, I mean, in the HBR, in the HBR patient, the patient have a GFR that lower than the patient in the in the non HBR. So uh, that's why we can capture the patient who is high risk more than the precise depth score. So uh, this is just only uh, my my assumption. I think you are also aware of the pendulum study just recently published. Uh, I think one week ago. Uh, yeah, this right. is a robust uh, data from uh, from uh, Japan, uh, reporting uh, their experience in using this uh, 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 high bleeding risk uh, according to uh, uh, ARC uh, criteria, and they very nicely shows the applicability of this uh, 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 scoring system uh, to, in Japanese patients in their uh, more than six thousand patients. And uh, my question to you is uh, whether uh, if, 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 if uh, one center detect uh, the patient is in high bleeding risk uh, condition, do they change their practice? Uh, for example, uh, they, they, uh, uh, they incline to use transradial approach or they shorten the duration of dual antiplatelet administration or uh, any other, uh, or they administer PPI in combinations with uh, DAP. So is there any, any change or difference in the practice uh, uh, in treating uh, high bleeding risk patients as compared to non-high bleeding risk uh, population? Yeah, I think actually when the, the ESC guideline 2020 came out last year, and uh, there's a trend of the physician who uh, also try to uh, uh, decrease the risk of bleeding by using the RHBR. But just only the problem is that the RHBR patient also in the high uh, ischemic risk. So sometimes even they really want to like um, to shorten the, the duration, but sometimes we just put a lot of stent. That's still the limitation that we have to explore whether this criteria is, is generalized for all kind of um, interventional procedure, or mm -hmm. in in like a, just only a STEMI case, um, or just only a chronic coronary syndrome. So, uh, but I think that it generalized because they already have like validation or study for, for almost I think in burn is sixty thousand. Um, that should be fine, but just only uh, maybe we have to do like a prospective study to see that uh, if we really collect that in real life and we can capture that or not. All right. Thank you very much, Dr. Swanasom. It's a really interesting study. So uh, the, the next will be, uh, please, Prof. Santoso, to introduce uh, the next speaker. Yes, uh, we'll have the last presentations uh, to be delivered by Dr. Wang from Huai Hospital, uh, entitled Five-Year Clinical Outcome of Successful Vascularization for CTO in Patients with uh, in patients with versus uh, with or without uh, diabetes mellitus. Dr. Wang. Mm, thank you, Mr. Moderator and Mr. Panelist for your gracious introduction. It is my great honor to have the chance to address you on this special occasion. My name is Pei Ji Wang from Fuwai Hospital, China. The topic of my paper is five-year clinical outcomes of successful recognition for coronary chronic total occlusions in patients with versus without type 2 diabetes mellitus. The outline of my talk is as follows. CTO, which is defined as a native coronary artery that is completely obstructed with TME grade zero flow for more than three months, is, observe, is, is observed in approximately 15 to 25% of patients undergoing diagnostic coronary angiography. Considerable evidence suggests that successful percutaneous coronary intervention of CTO lesions is associated with a greater improvement of symptoms, quality of life, and left ventricular function compared with failed CTO-PCI 
or initial medical treatment alone. Current guidelines have recommended CDOPCI as class IIA and the level of evidence B. However, the long-term beneficial effect of successful CTOPCI remains uncertain. Diabetes mellitus, a well-known coronary artery disease risk factor, is associated with a greater burden, including diffuse CAD, multi-vessel disease, and heavy calcifications. DM is also relatively common in coronary CTO patients which suggests that DM may be a risk factor for CTO. Moreover, the existence of DM could also have a detrimental effect on collateral circulation development and microcirculation function. But five-year impact of successful recognition for CTO lesions between diabetes and non-diabetes population remains unknown and controversial. Our study enrolled a total of 719 consecutive patients with one successful P CTO PCI, at least throughout 2013, and were grouped into diabetic and non-diabetic patients. Baseline angiographic and follow-up data were collected. The primary endpoints were major adver adverse cardiac and uh, cerebral vas vascular events, which consist of cardiac death, recurrent myocardial infraction, stroke, and uh, target vessel vascularization. The secondary endpoint was all-cause mortality. Propensity score matching was also done to balance the baseline characteristics. A comparison of endpoints was done to eva evaluate long-term outcomes. Notably, compared with non-diabetic patients, those in the DM group were older, had more females in gender distribution and uh, had a higher percentage of lower LVEF, multivessel disease, and other comorbidities. During a median follow-up of five years, there was a significant difference between the two groups with, with respect to the prevalence of all-cause mortality and MACCE. Both log rank p-value are less than 0.05. Through multivariate analysis, the rate of MACCE was significantly higher in the diabetic group than in the di non-diabetic group. However, in the propensity score matched population, 289 pairs, there were no significant differences in the prevalence of MACCE and all-cause mortality between groups. Subgroup analysis revealed a consistent effect on five-year MACCE across various subgroups. Above all, we assessed the five-year cardiovascular survival of successful CTO-PCI patients with or without DM in a prospective and real-world cohort population. Notably, we confirmed the following. Diabetic with successful recognition for CTO lesions are highly prone to multivessel disease, complex lesions, and lower LVEF. Non-diabetic patients were related to better long-term survival benefit in terms of MACCE for the treatment of successful CTO-PCI. These findings may provide clinical insight into treatment options for unselected patients with diabetes. Our study had some limitations. First, it was a prospective and ob observational study. The results cannot be comparable to those of randomized control trial. Second, our real-world cohort is not a specialized CTO cohort, so that we may not have a larger sample size of CTO PCI patients in our population. Third, there was a lack of specific information in our database, such as coronary, collateral scoring. The authors declare that they, had, they have no conflict of interest. In conclusion, CTO-PCI is a beneficial treatment in, guide, in guideline recommendation with risk of failure. We prove that successful CTO-PCI has a better long-term prognosis for non-DM patients compared 
Uh, for unselected DM patients, successful CTO PCI is also a beneficial option. For the randomized controlled trial and longer term follow up are necessary to confirm our results. Thank you. Uh, very nice study. Congratulations. Uh, I have one short question. Uh, do you have uh, data showing that, because uh, at least uh, uh, we, we, I think uh, we also know that uh, there is a, a, another so, a study showing that successful C2 intervention in diabetic uh, patients had better prognosis as compared to those in non-diabetic patients. And this is uh, probably because of the detrimental effect of the uh, of diabetes in the collateral circulation and also in the macrovascular circulation. So if we improve, uh, if we can open the CTO, the result would be uh, better as compared to non-diabetic. Do, do you have any chance to uh, study this uh, 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 phenomenon? Mm. Thank you, thank you for your comment. And uh, our database, uh, our database was lack of the info information of uh, of the of the collateral uh, collateral score. And, and but some but other study I have I have read, and uh, I think I think both of both of the two. Both of both of the two ways um, will 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 be beneficial to CTO patients. Thank you. Any other questions, Dr. Doni or uh, other members of the panelists? Yes, uh, my question will be: uh, You know, there's a lot of uh, CTO trials, and then some is very conflicting one another. The last one is a decision CTO by Korean Group. Showing maybe if you routine doing CTO in, in all patient, maybe the we, we will be the questioning the benefit of the CTO. So my question will be: so is this a symptomatic patient or or you could you 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 fill in all the patient with symptomatic or asymptomatic CTO in your in your study? Mm. Could you please re repeat your question? Oh yes, uh, it is symptomatic or asymptomatic patients because in your chart I didn't see is that the patient is symptomatic or asymptomatic all right uh, our, our, our cohort um, is a consecutive cohort throughout 2013 it's not it is not a specialized specialized CTO cohort but uh, all the patients um, all the patients did the PCI in our in our hospital, and uh, in, uh, in 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 our database there may um, maybe they uh, uh, most of them are sim uh, most of them had sim symptom, um, but uh, some people some people um, may cho may choose PCI. During the diagnostic coronary angiography, yeah. All right, thank you. Any other questions? Uh, we all uh, have uh, heard uh, very nice presentations from uh, various parts of uh, uh, our continent. And uh, on behalf of our chairman, Dr. Doni, and also the organizing committee, we would like to thank all speakers and also members of the panelists and all, uh, for the very nice presentations and discussion. We'll see you during the real virtual TCT Asia Pacific in April. Thank you so much. Kamsa Amnida. <laughs>